to. You no, know, like a great dramatist like Shakespeare, let's say, is, we know that what he wrote is fiction, and then we say, well, fiction isn't true. But then you think, well, wait a minute. Maybe it's true like numbers are true. You know, numbers are an abstraction from the underlying reality, but no one in their right mind would really think numbers aren't true. You could even make a case that the numbers are more real than the things that they represent, right? Because the abstraction is so insanely powerful. Once you have mathematics, you're just deadly. You can move the world with mathematics. And so it's not obvious that the abstraction is less real than the, than the, than, than the more concrete reality. And you take a work of fiction like Hamlet, and you think, well, is that, it, it's, it's not true because it's fiction. But then you think, wait a minute, what kind of explanation is that? Like maybe it's more true than nonfiction, because it takes what the story that needs to be told about you and the story that needs to be told about you and you and you and you and abstracts that out and says, look, here's something that's a key part of the human experience as such, right? So it's, it's an abstraction from this underlying noisy substrate and, and people are affected by it because they see that the thing that's represented is part of the pattern of their being. That's the right way to think about it. And then with these old stories, these ancient stories, it seems to me like that process has been occurring for thousands of years. It's like we watched ourselves and we extracted out some stories. We imitated each other and we represented that in drama. And then we distilled the drama and we got a representation of the distillation. And then we did it again. And at the end of that process that took God only knows how long, like, I think some of these stories They've traced fairy tales back 10,000 years, some fairy tales, in relatively unchanged form. And it certainly seems to me that the archaeological evidence, for example, suggests that the really old stories that, that, that the Bible begins with are at least that old and likely embedded in a prehistory that's far older than that. And you might think, well, how can you be so sure? And the answer to that in part is that cultures that don't change like the ancient cultures, right? They didn't change as fast as this. They stay the same. That's the answer. So they, call, they keep their information moving generation to generation. That's how they stay the same. And so we know, again, in the archaeological record, there are records of rituals that have remained relatively unbroken for up to 20,000 years. It was discovered in caves in Japan that were set up for a particular kind of bear worship that was also characteristic of Western Europe. So these things can last for very long periods of time. We're watching each other act in the world. And then the question is, well, how long have we been watching each other? And the answer to that, in some sense, is, well, as long as there's been creatures with nervous systems. And that's a long time. You know, that's some hundreds of millions of years, perhaps longer than that. We've been watching each other, trying to figure out what we're up to across that entire span of time. And some of that knowledge is built right into our bodies, which is why we can dance with each other, for example, right? Because Understanding isn't just something that you, that you have as an abstraction, it's something that you act out. You know? That's what children are doing when they're learning to rough and tumble play, is they're learning to integrate their body with the body of someone else in a harmonious way, learning to cooperate and compete, and that's all instantiated right into their body. It's not abstract knowledge. They don't know that they're doing that, they're just doing it. And so we can even use our body as a representational platform. So we've been studying each other for a long time, abstracting out what is it that we're up to. And that's, that, that's what is it we're up to? What should we be up to? That's even a more fundamental question. If you're going to live in the world and you're going to do it properly, what does properly mean? And how is it that you might go about that? Well, it, it's the right question, right? It's what everyone wants to know. How do you live in the world? Not what is the world made of? It's not the same question. How do you live in the world? It's the eternal question of human beings. And I guess we're the only species that has ever really asked that question because all the other animals, they just go and do whatever they do. Not us. It's a question for us. We've had to, we have to become aware of it. We have to be able to speak it. God only knows why. But that seems to be the situation. So, we act. That acting is shaped by the world. That acting is shaped by society into something that we don't understand, but that we can model. That we can model. We model it in our stories. We model it with our bodies. And that's where the dream gets its information. The dream is part of the process that's watching everything and then trying to formulate it and trying to say, well, 
trying to get the signal out from the noise and to portray it in dramatic form, because a dream is little drama. And then you get the chance to talk about what that dream is. And then you have, it, you have something like articulated knowledge at that point. And so the Bible, I would say, is, is it's sort of, it exists in that space that's half into the dream and half into articulated knowledge. It's something like that. And going into it to find out what the stories are about can, what can, what, it can aid our self-understanding. And then the other issue is, is that if Nietzsche was correct and if Dostoevsky or Jung was correct and Dostoevsky as well, we, without the cornerstone that that understanding provides, we're lost. And that's not good because then we're susceptible to psychic pathology. That's psychological pathology. You know, the people who are ad adamant anti-religious thinkers seem to believe that if we abandoned our immersement in the underlying dream that we'd all instantly become rationalists like Descartes or Bacon or, you know, intelligent, clear-thinking, rational, scientific people. And I don't believe that for a moment because I don't think there's any evidence for it. I think we would become so irrational so rapidly that the weirdest mysteries of Catholicism would seem positively rational by contrast, and I think that's already happening. So... <laughs> okay. So this is the idea, essentially, you know, that you have the unknown world. That, that's just what you don't know at all. That's, that's the outside. That's the ocean that surrounds the island that you inhabit, something like that. It's chaos itself. And then you act in that world, and you act in ways you don't understand. There's more to your actions than you can understand. One of the things Jung said, I loved this when I first understood it. He said, everybody acts out a myth, but very few people know what their myth is. And you should know what your myth is because it might be a tragedy and maybe you don't want it to be. And that's really worth thinking because thinking about because you're, you have a pattern of behavior that characterizes you, you know, and God only knows where you got it. Partly it's biological, partly it's from your parents, it's, it's your unconscious assumptions, it's the way the philosophy of your society has shaped you and it's, it's aimed, it's aiming you somewhere. Well, is it aiming you somewhere you want to go? That's a good question. That's part of self-realization, you know. We know we don't understand our actions. That's almost every argument you have with someone is about that. It's like, well, why did you do that? And you come up with some half-baked reasons why you did it. You're <laughs> flailing around in the darkness, you know. You try to give an account for yourself, but you can only do it partially. It's very, very difficult because you're, in, you're, in, you're a complicated animal with the, the beginnings of an articulated mind, something like that. And, you're just way more than you can handle, and, and... All right, so you act things out, right? You, you act things out, and that's a kind of competence. And then you imagine what you act out, and you imagine what everyone else acts out. And so there's a tremendous amount of information in your action, and then that information is translated up into the dream, and into art, into mythology and literature, and there's a tremendous amount of information in that. And then some of that is translated into articulated thought. And I'll give you a quick example of something like that. I think this is partly what happens in Exodus when Moses comes up with the law. You know, he's wandering around with the Israelites forever in the desert. And they're, they're like going left and going right and worshipping idols and like having a hell of a time. And, um, you know, getting rebellious. And Moses goes up in the mountain and he has this tremendous revelation sort of in the sight of God. And it illuminates him and he comes down with the law. You think, well, you know, Moses acted as a judge. I know this is a mythological story. Moses acted as a judge in the desert. He was continually mediating between people who were having problems, constantly trying to keep peace. And so what are you doing when you're trying to keep peace? Is you're trying to understand what peace is, right? You have to apply the principles. Well, what are the principles? Well, you don't know. The principles are whatever satisfies people enough to make peace. And maybe you do that 10,000 times, and then you get some sense of, oh, here's the principles that bring peace. And then one day it blasts into your consciousness like, like a revelation. Here's the rules that we're already acting out. Well, that's the Ten Commandments. It's, they're there to begin with. And Moses comes forward and says, look, this is already basically what we're doing. But now it's codified, right? And 
Like, that's all a historical process that's condensed into a single story. But obviously that happened because we have written law, right? And that emerged in, in good legal systems. That emerges from the bottom up. That's English common law is exactly like that, right? It's single decisions that are predicated on principles that are then, then articulated and made into the body of law. And the body of law is something you act out. That's why it's a body of law. If you're a good citizen, you act out the body of law, and the body of law has principles. Okay, so the question is, there's principles that guide our behavior. What are those principles? Well, I think when you, if you, if you want the initial answer of what the ar archaic Israelites meant by God, that's something like what they meant. Now, it's not a good enough explanation, but look, imagine that, you, that, you have a, that you're a chimpanzee, and you have a powerful... Uh, uh, dominant figure at the pinnacle of your society, that, that represents power. Now more than that, because it, it's not sheer physical prowess that keeps a chimp at the top of the hierarchy. It's much more complicated than that. But you could say, well, there's, there's a principle that the dominant person manifests. And then you might say, well, that principle shines forth even more brightly if you know ten people who are dominant, powerful. Then you can extract out what dominance means from that. You can extract out what power means from that. And then you can divorce the concept from the people. And we had to do that at some point because we can say power in a human context and we can imagine what that means, but it's divorced from any specific manifestation of power. Well, how the hell did we do that? Like, that's so complicated. When, if you're a chimp, the power is in another chimp. It's not some damn abstraction. Well, so the, so the question is, think, think about it. We're, we're in these hierarchies, many of them across centuries. We're trying to figure out what the guiding principle is. We're trying to extract out the core of the guiding principle. And we turn that into a representation of a pattern of being. Well, it's, it's something like that. That's God. It's an abstracted ideal. And it's, it's, it's put in personified form. It manifests itself in personified form. But that, that's okay, because what we're trying to get at is the in some sense, the essence of what it means to be a properly functioning and properly, properly functioning, properly social and properly competent individual. We're trying to figure out what that means. You need a, an embodiment, you need an ideal that's abstracted that you could act out that would enable you to understand what that means. And that's what we've been driving at. So that's the first hypothesis in some sense. I'm going to go over some of the some of the attributes of this abstracted ideal that we formalized as God. But that's the first sort of hypothesis, is that a philosophical or moral ideal manifests itself first as a concrete pattern of behavior that's characteristic of a single individual. And then it's a set of individuals. And then it's an abstraction from that set. And then you have the abstraction. It's so important.